Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer. Buddha at the Gas Pump is an ongoing series of interviews with spiritually awakening people. Um, we've done about 200, 345 of them so far, and if this is new to you, you could go to bathgap.com and you'll see all the previous ones archived and categorized under the past interviews menu. Um, this is made possible by the support of appreciative donors and list uh, donors. So. Um, if you have been donating, we thank you for that. And if you'd like to, there's a PayPal button on the right-hand side of the site. My guest today is Ganga Mira. Uh, Ganga Mira was born Genevieve de Kook in Belgium in 1947. Um, in 1968, during her second year at the university while studying philosophy, she stumbled upon a saying of Socrates, which actually was written uh, in the Temple of Apollo at Delphi but Socrates and Plato and others quoted it, which hit her straight in the heart, and that saying was, know thyself. Realizing that this was precisely what she had always been looking for, she instantly dropped her studies and set out, set out for India by road in search of a living Socrates or Buddha. On reaching the Himalayan foothills, she led a meditative and ascetic life by the Ganges in Rishikesh, waiting to meet her master. The locals called her Mira because of her devoted renunciation. At the end of 1968, in circumstances well worthy of Indian mythology, which we're going to talk about a little bit, she met a man whom she, with whom she had an awakening experience. He left the following day without Mira knowing anything about him, neither his name nor his address. <clears throat> the one certainty was that finally she had found her master. To give herself the best chance of seeing him again, she decided to live at the exact spot of their meeting. For eight months, she waited for him and meditated under a little tree on the banks of the Ganga River. One day, her master, H. W. L. Punja, a disciple of Ramana Maharshi, um, and by the way, most people know this, but that's Papaji, we'll be talking about him, um, came back for her. She became his disciple and wife and started to travel with him. In 1971, Papaji was invited to give satsang in Europe and Mira accompanied him. Their daughter Mukti was born in 1972, and the little family went on traveling the world. For the education of her daughter, Mira returned to Belgium. In 1990, H.W.L. Punja, also called Papaji, settled permanently in Lucknow, where he gave satsang every day until he passed away in 1997. In 1998, Mira was invited to give satsang, which she continues giving to this day all over the world. She decided to call herself Ganga. In 2004, Ganga Mira moved to Portugal. She lives near the wild ocean of the Algarve with her daughter Mukti and her grandchildren and gives satsang four times a week. So, ah, now, you don't, now you don't have to say all that. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I've listened to quite a few of those satsangs, maybe about an hour and a half long. I've listened to maybe five of them over the past week and enjoyed them very much. They're very lighthearted and informal, and but very kind of... Um, direct and clear and cut to the chase, as we say. Um, so I'd like to go over some of these biographical things a little bit more, if we could, because you have such a fascinating story. I told uh, David Godman that I was going to be interviewing you, and he said, oh, you should read uh, certain pages and, and nothing ever happened. So I, I managed to get a hold of the books. Um, which nothing ever happened is a, an extensive, over about 1,500 page biography of Papaji. And I, I read the whole section, all the sections I could find about you. And every time I started reading something, I got so caught up in the story that I just kept reading, even past those particular pages. So that's a whole fascinating thing in itself. But um, <laughs> I'd love to just go through a few of these points with you in a little bit more detail before we get into the actual points of the teaching. Um, for one thing, I mean, it was. I, I found it very impressive that you just, um, as soon as you knew what you wanted, you just dropped everything you're doing and headed east, headed to India. Um, that showed a great deal, I think, of perhaps dedication, courage. I would say fire. Fire. I, yes, because you see, I was so des desperate that um, I had to, to find or to die. You know how the youth is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was only that possibility. <laughs> so I wanted it first to find. And I believed so much in the ways of the Buddhas because of my background. You know, I, I read a lot and I was always fascinated by the stories of disciples and the Buddha, or uh, this lineage at least. 
And um, so, yeah, I had to, I, I was sure, I was determined that that was the way to find a living master. So if you had already been reading a lot about Buddhism and so on, you must have already known about the concept of knowing the self, right? But how, how is it that this saying of the, the oracle at Delphi or, or Socrates suddenly struck you when your previous reading hadn't, hadn't done so? You know, I was probably not that much matured. I was just very attracted by uh, wisdom, even though I, didn't, I could not put a name on it. But when I read Socrates, then suddenly I found that was it because I put the, the, the question to myself and I, not in a psychological way. So, and I could not answer. I saw this is it, but I don't know. Mm. So the time was right and it really hit you. It yeah. hit, hit deeply. Probably. Yeah. And this thing of, of hitchhiking to India amazes me. I mean, you, you couldn't do that these days with, oh, and, no. and live to tell about it. But, <laughs> but in those days, I guess a lot of people were doing it. A lot. A lot of people did. Myself, I did it with my boyfriend two years back, uh, mm -hmm. two years before. And uh, we went up to India, crossing all the land. So because of that, I knew where to stop. I see. And I felt familiar, more or less, to the... So I was... Uh, and I was so determined, you see, it was really a question of life or death. So you are so determined. Yeah. So I was helped in that way. Yeah. So this, you must have been 20 years old at that time. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, so you got to Rishikesh and uh, you were living a meditative, ascetic life. And, and then Papaji showed up for one day and disappeared. And then you actually just lived under this tree day and night, didn't you? I mean, yeah. you, you didn't have a little hut that you went to. You just lived under the tree. Yeah, under the tree. That was enough, isn't it? Some people say that the roof is the sky. I had the shade of the tree. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there must have been rain and snakes. Well, it was and... cold, especially cold. The oh. rainy season, not at that time, but very cold. Yes. Yeah, it gets quite cold in Rishikesh. You just had like one blanket. and Exactly, one blanket and fire. I was making fire. That was my main occupation, a bit Zen-ish like, you know, <laughs> go and fetch the wood and make fire and feel yeah. cold, but you are in the blanket and you, uh, you trust that's the way. So. <laughs> mm. And you just slept right on the ground, right? You didn't have a, mat oh, yeah, a mattress yeah, yeah. or anything. Yeah. yeah. Maybe. The youth, the youth can make those things, you know. It's true, yeah. Well, <laughs> <laughs> uh, well but it's impressive. I mean, it, it, it's uh, symptomatic, I would say, of your ardency, you know, your, your zeal, your, your fire, to use mm -hmm. your word. Um, and wouldn't you say, this, this is something you might want to comment on, that um, the more ardent, you know the word ardent, the more, the more zealous, the, more, yeah. the, the, the brighter the fire, um, yeah. the more somehow nature responds to it, right? Or, uh, no, the fire has to be directed, you see. Mm -hmm. If it is, if it is uh, the fire for something you know, then, then it will present. That's true, but uh, some does, don't know yet. They have fire, but they have not yet seen what for. So yeah. I, I, had, I was lucky enough to know what I wanted, sure. Right. And that's why, that's why probably I met the one I needed. Yeah. I believe in that. Yeah. Well, someone might say, I, I, well, I have a fire to be a rock star, or I really want to be a doctor or something. And if you really do, then that's probably what yeah. you're going to do. But in your case, it was just the one thing. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, okay. And so uh, when you, you were meditating under this little tree for like hours and hours and hours a day, right? Just sitting in... It was sitting, it was bathing in the Ganges, it was walking a little bit. And uh, I guess, you know, I was in a state, maybe it's a, maybe a big word, but a kind of samadhi state. All the time? Uh, was not so aware. Yeah, you, you know, that meeting was so strong. It threw me in such a state that um, I could live like this. Mm. Yeah. So even the very brief meeting that happened shifted your whole 
complete. consciousness or whatever. Complete. Interesting, and that, and it stage shifted all that time. Stage shift. In, in other words, it, it was a permanent shift. Even that that one but meeting. That, it was a permanent shift to probably not really because I wanted to to go back there since it it looked to me the, the real thing I wanted, you mm. know, and I knew I needed help for that mm. from from the master. So, but I was put in a state where um, I could have waited all my life. <laughs> I was just going to ask that. I was, get, I was just going to ask, like, did you ever have doubts? Like, you know, maybe this guy isn't no. going to show up again and I should no. just go and <laughs> you no. just you were just going to sit there for the rest of your life if you had to. Yeah. yeah. Otherwise, I had to die. You know, I had this promise in me. So <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. You know, but the master said, I don't love you because you are beautiful or whatever. It's because I recognize that fire. Right. And I think today I, I measure more what he meant. It's true. It's true. The fire was there. Mm. Among your current students or, or those you've been meeting with, do you see any fire of that degree of intensity? Oh. You, maybe you make them go sleep out on the grass <laughs> just to test it. <laughs> oh, I have to ask my daughter to be like Kamali. You know the story of Kabir and his daughter. <laughs> no, how does that go? Okay. <laughs> you go to see my father, otherwise I, I cut off your head. And, uh, you know, but first I have to cut off your head and nobody went, of course, because that was too much. Ah. I mean, something like that. Of course, you know, the people, you know, I must say, a few friends, I call them my friends, who, who dedicate their life to live where I live in Portugal, where it is, there is nothing here. They are very fiery because it's not easy to live here. And they, they are here for such time. Yeah. So surely they have fire. Um. What would you say people can do? I mean, I think most people understand what you mean by fire and they realize it would be a good thing, but maybe they feel like their fire is just a little flame. What would you say people can do to bright, to make the fire more intense, yeah. you know, to, you to increase the intensity? Yeah. First of all, let them ask what is their priority in life means I have to die soon. What I want to realize first. If it is liberation, it gives an urgency, it gives more fire. And then you keep the company of those who love that too, you see, who have the same passion. So there are beautiful books nowadays available of the same lineage speaking of indicating liberation and satsang life. For me, it's very important. Mm. And what would you say to people who you know, they, they want, they say, they say they want liberation, but they also want to raise a family and they want to make some money and they want this and that and the other thing. Uh, how would you comment if they came to you and said that? Well, I would welcome them because I think it's already fantastic to introduce satsang in their life. Mm -hmm. But of course, they cannot expect probably to realize on the spot as it can be because of those uh, desires that they want to fulfill still. So they have what, like one leg here and one leg there, which is already fantastic when you see how the world uh, runs after, you know? Right. <laughs> And, in your, and they might say, well, in your case, you, you had a daughter, and so you had some kind of worldly interest. But I think yeah. your case is a little bit different because your husband was a master. <laughs> yeah. And also, you know, uh, you may be surprised I speak like this. Uh, it was not my desire. I was uh, following, uh, believing in uh, the path of detachment. Mm -hmm. So um, I totally... Um, surrender to, to whatever was happening with my master because I knew that was the most precious. So it was always for me, uh, the master was the first. It's, I never forget, forgot uh, him as a master right. first, you see. And now, of course, 
the wonderful thing is that I'm, I'm very happy that he gave me a daughter, a family, and it removes also, it removed the separation between this and that. What do you mean by that? I mean that you can cook and still be totally fiery mm. to, to if, if you didn't realize yourself yet, to dedicate a second to that, whatever you do, yes. whatever you do, mm -hmm. that separation is, has always been erased by the master. Because, you know, the time I was with him, it was like uh, we were walking, uh, busy marketing uh, the market uh, to buy potatoes or making tea or simply sit or hearing him. Uh, there was no particular moment. Every moment could be that one. Mm -hmm. So it didn't so much matter what you were doing on the outside, Not but so apparent, you know, appearances yeah. were superficial, but on the inside that fire was burning. Yeah, it, as you probably are aware in the in the Bhagavad Gita, it says that you know it's a very great fortune to be born in a family of yogis. Uh, so your daughter has that very great fortune. Um, has she turned out to be a ardent spiritual aspirant or, or you know person? Is she as interested in spirituality as her as her parents? And so you can make it as you like, but she comes to every satsang, and her father is her master. So. Hmm. <laughs> that's, that's great. And she has a couple of children herself now, so your grandma. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, okay. Um, you mentioned that in this little bio that I read that for the education of your daughter Mira, you returned to Belgium and in, in, uh, you returned to Belgium. And in 1990, Papaji set up you know, yeah. in, in luck now permanently. Does that mean that you became separated or were you somehow back and forth and... Oh, of course we were visiting. First of all, we never felt separated up to a certain extent in time mm -hmm. because our uh, letters, correspondence was very intense. Each letter I wrote, he was replying with great love and great teaching in it. Mm -hmm. So we were with him actually. Yeah. Now, uh, physically, we could meet him only every three years because of lack of money. Yeah, because of that. Uh -huh. And uh, but uh, as I say, uh, that was not felt like this. Now, in 1990, in 1990, when he was in Lucknow, that was another phase of his life. You see, so. Uh, it was not, there was no place for a family life yeah. as we knew him. So for us, that was a big shift. Yeah, at that point he became kind of famous and all these, yeah. all these people who are now satsang teachers were, were there, Neelam and Gangaji and Muji and all these, Andrew Cohen and all kinds of people were, were sure. hanging oh. around him in those days. Yeah, which, yeah. Was, which is fantastic. And you know, when I met to him in 92 in Lucknow, I really knew my time is over. I had, I had so much, you know, I had to chew that now really by myself. It was time for others. Uh, that was wonderful, isn't it? Huh. Uh, when I saw his satsang, first satsang, in a quite different way, in a bit like this, in an official way he gave, he said everything in one satsang that I had to hear all those 29 years. I mean, it was extraordinary. Huh. It packed it all into one satsang. Huh? Yes. Huh. Yeah. So. Interesting. Um. <laughs> well, it's my experience. I don't know if it is. <laughs> I think I heard you say in one of your satsangs that I was listening to that it took you about Correct me if I'm wrong, but this is what I gathered, that it, that it took you about 30 years before realization took place. Yeah, 29. 29 years. Yeah. Um, so that, it, that sort of sounds like realization took place just around the time that you left to live in Belgium for educating your daughter. Is, is that about right? No, no, no. Oh. No, no. You know, 68 till 1997 makes 29 years, no? Okay, good. Yeah, my math is yeah. off. Yeah. No, no. 
I was still a seeker. So I must say I remember in time because anyway, it's an experience in time. Yeah. But I didn't take it this way, but today I can say. In 1987, uh, the search dropped. 87. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I was, I was, um, and I felt we saw the daring to tell myself and but hoping it is so, uh, this is it. But, of, you know, I was in such a good school that I was surely not telling anybody. <laughs> yeah. So, but um, later on, I saw there was still a seeker mm. having no search. That ah. was my trap. That's very interesting. It's interesting you should make that distinction. Um, there's, there, there's something like that in my own experience where this, the, there's a feeling that the search dropped some time ago. I don't know exactly when, but there's no longer, because I can remember what it was like to just be uh, dying yeah. and yearning and got to have this. And, and yeah. now I feel a great deal of contentment, but I wouldn't consider myself to be fully realized or any such mm -hmm. thing, because it, to, to, be, to be honest, you know. Because of, of the seeker remaining. Yeah, there's because some seeker. The seeker yes. feels a great deal of contentment, I suppose, but there, there's still a continuous curiosity and inquiry and all that. You because know? of that, yeah. there's too much there. Mm. <laughs> but it's, you know, it's of a great help to know why, to know exactly why have that feeling still too, the search is over. Yeah, it's almost like this. It, it's it's almost like it shifted from a seeking to to ex, to an adventure. You know, it's like there's still more to discover and, and a deeper appreciation to be achieved, etc. But this the sense of gotta find this, gotta have it. That that somehow has dropped off. I don't know if yeah. that makes sense. Yeah, I, I would say. One got an accomplishment, you see, it doesn't seek after all, it's what one hears. Don't seek, you have already that. Mm -hmm. But the thing is that the seeker is still there, so he still trusts the, the so-called reality of what his mind will suggest. And that is exactly what he will suggest when the search is gone, mm. that uh, there is still a deepening or something beyond or something more interesting or, as you say, a deep contentment, but it's still an experience. It is, and there's, there seems to be an experiencer. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It, some people speak about their having no sense whatsoever of a personal self anymore, and I can't really relate to that personally because I, yeah. I still feel like I have one. <laughs> yeah. But I'm, so I'm just trying, trying to be honest about my experience, but that's where it's at at the moment. Yeah, it's very interesting to see that you are so aware of it. It's great. So I wonder what is aware? What is this awareness? Well, it's, it's, it's not an easy thing to express in words, is it? Ah, but that's great. So it means you are it. Yes. Because if you could express, you objectify it. So you are never what you can objectify. It's no, you, you can't step apart from it and say, okay, here I am and here's the awareness, you know, as if the, the awareness were some kind of object you could perceive. It doesn't work that way. Well, quite a few people say, uh, I know what's awareness. I experience awareness. Then it's an object. Yeah. No, that's not my sense. Yeah. So uh, nice. Yeah. Um, a question just came in. Let's see what it is. Um, Okay, we might as well ask this. This is from uh, Srini Ramakrishnan in Chennai. Uh, I don't know if that's a man or woman, but he or she asks, I hear it stressed time and again by most modern masters that awakening has nothing to do with thoughtlessness, but only to do with waking up to one's true nature. Oh, great. How important is total and complete cessation of thought and mind to liberation? I would not say that it's the same, you see. You can have a mind with no thought. Um, liberation is not to have no thoughts. Liberation is not to care anymore about the flow of the mind which can appear or not, because it has been demystifying the, the so-called reality of the mind. The mind is seen as unreal, so that there is a flow of thought or not, who would care? First of all, who is there to care? 
So in other words, the mind does what the mind does, which is have thoughts or, or not yeah. have thoughts. But yeah. that's not that's not relevant that's, to whether one is liberated. It's not relevant. It's relevant in the beginning of the search because you see, you don't you you don't give space to this to this desire for freedom. So it's good to start to analyze what's mind by probably in self investigation, some practice of meditation do that too to have a quieter mind means emptier mind mm. but the goal is not to have a, a mind a mind doesn't exist if there is no thoughts <laughs> yeah it might be a little hard to function if if you didn't have a mind right? <laughs> um let's probe a little bit more into your experience uh, you mentioned in, what i think you said 90 was it 87 97? Uh, 97. 90, 97. Uh, tw- left the body? Well, 29 years you had this awakening. Yeah, 97. And yeah. In 97. Right around the time when Papaji left the body. Um, was it actually coincidental with when Papaji left the body or I, some months apart? I, no, 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 no. It was the second he left the body. I tell you what happened. When I, first of all, I didn't know the state of Papaji at that time. And uh, so when I learned is uh, leaving the body, for me, it came immediately that it was an event as important that to have met him. Hmm. And so it created in me an urgency. I have to do it now because I know I will never, never trust anybody else. Hmm. You see? So I wonder what suddenly a big doubt came. What did I hear from him after all? Did I hear anything right? And it left me in one sentence I always took as a as a tool, don't land anywhere. Hmm. He was telling that. And then that I tell you it went very quick, but I remember the steps. And then for the first time of my life, it shows how bad student I was, (laughs) I asked, but who is not landing? Mm. And that was it. So I can tell exactly in time that I had that experience of the disappearance of the concept I am real, I is real, and yet the realization is when you exactly also don't take this experience for it, you see. I was, I had, I must say, an excellent background with my master. An excellent background? Background. What do you mean by that? I mean that whatever I could hear from him, I had enough time to probably that it entered in myself, that at the proper moment, they came and they had the, the, effect so yeah so it just finally came to fruition at that time yeah Yeah. Yeah. it's very interesting it's it's interesting that at his death you should right then have the big shift Um, I know when my father died I didn't know that he had died that day and Ah. and I was having this incredibly blissful day and I was thinking what is going on why am I so amazingly blissful Ah. and and then later on I found out he had died that day and I wondered after whether there had been some kind of connection between me and him so that when he was released from his mortal coil I experienced some kind of release at the same time probably probably sure Sure. So I wonder if somehow Papaji's Mahasamadhi in and of itself was a catalyst for your... Probably because you see the urgency and the, the, the knowing I cannot go anywhere else if I cannot... To whom I will ask then, you see, right. I knew that will be not available anymore. So that created for me this... Yeah. And so how would you characterize your experience prior to that day, day to day, you know, going through your day? What was your subjective interaction with life like compared with after that day when that realization had taken place? Uh, there, it, there is nothing in common. 
absolutely nothing. What I thought was real, but still I could not, there was somewhere a lack of, of something, uh, was still very peaceful. And I had no more uh, questions about knowledge and whatnot. And I, I could, I understood master. I could even tell the same uh, answer as he was telling. I mean, I knew the subject well, but it is not, you cannot compare. It's incomparable. So that was before you knew the subject. You could, you could speak the words and so on. But then but, after. Uh, well, I want to say first that we speak then now of a story because in fact, the realization is that there is no before and after. Right, right. Yet, yet I agree that, well, after, you know, I was like so, so overwhelmed by great uh, gratitude mm -hmm. that I could not move. And uh, I think at that time it was a great blessing also to have been alone. Uh, in Belgium, in Brussels, and so I stayed, uh, I think, two months sitting and I could not stop writing, mm -hmm. and so I have a diary mm -hmm. and um, of revelations, knowing very well that I would not take the revelations for it, but I could not help, you know. Just wanted to express it. Yeah, yeah, I had to, it was too, too strong. Did you ever it, publish that? No, it's in a, I never read it again. <laughs> <laughs> so bad. <laughs> you, you could publish it sometime. <laughs> My daughter may do that. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> when I'm not there. So, um, as you know, these days there are hundreds of people running around um, offering satsang. And they may, come, they may come from different lineages, but a lot of people use that word. Um, yeah. And I don't know if I've ever actually had anybody on, on this show who defined carefully what, sat what satsang actually is or what it does. Um, so could you give us a, a good, clear definition? Yeah. Satsang can be um, resumed in, in one word. Um, there is looking like a guide, a finger, who will root out the demand of someone who is there, who must be a seeker after uh, truth, or he wants to liberate himself from what's unreal. So the satsang is exactly the space offered to uh, have an occasion to to awaken to one's own self and the help, some help may be there, but it will not be through a better understanding to it happens that way. It will be through rooting out the basic, because there is only one concept, I am born. I'm, I'm somebody. I, I am born, yeah, yeah. I'm somebody. Mm -hmm. So, and so it is again and again indicated this way, but the seeker will understand in different levels of his seeking. That depends on, on I, I don't know, that depends on his own opening, on his own fire, mm -hmm. on his own real priority. Hmm. Receptivity, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what does the actual Sanskrit mean of satsang? Yeah, the company of the truth. Company of means, the truth. In fact, being yourself, you know. Because right. company, who is, who is the company? It's it, being yourself. So what you just said, is that pretty much how Papaji would have defined it also? Or probably would have a better formula. He was a how. <laughs> He would have already rooted out our talk. <laughs> <Yeah>. um, <laughs> and would you say, I mean, both in terms of your own satsangs and in, as a general principle, um, is satsang um, primarily for spiritually mature souls, if you agree that there is such a thing, those at the end of their seeking, 
um, or is it for pretty much anybody, regardless of their... Anybody's welcome. Mm -hmm. And soon, very quickly, they will see it. it fits them or not. And those who are perseverant, good luck for them. Yeah, perseverant. Perseverant. Those, those who persevere, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. It means it, it fits their demands. Or at least more and more they see that's what I want. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you might say those, those who have a fairly bright fire, to use that term we've been using. Sure. Um, so you mentioned a minute ago that it's not so much about any intellectual understanding that is transmitted during satsang. It's it's more it's deeper than that. So would you say that it's there's some kind of transmission of silence? Um, no. That takes place, or some some sort of transmission, or or a, or I don't know attunement that takes place. No, I w no I I would not say so. Okay. So what are, what are the mechanics then? Those who, who come, but I don't leave it like this. I must say that um, surely um, I come um, quiet. I'm quiet even to I speak, mm -hmm. but and I respond to what's coming. Now, as Papaji, I see in the beginning of a satsang, sometimes I'm really, very often, I'm inspired, even if it is short, to say something. After the silence, something comes which can inspire or give a tune or a particular theme that day. Mm -hmm. um, but you see, satsang is not to specially experience silence because then it's a circumstantial silence that you can also have at any time in the life. I would love that those who still think they have a mind see that it's exactly because they think that their mind is real that they are in trouble. So they should hear and that is repeatedly uh, said in satsang that who has whose mind if you see that I was a mind can disappear as a concept, everything else glued to I means the mind and the body are just concepts. They are unreal even though they appear. Um, I don't know if I am clear. I think no. I'm following you. Um, and so what you just said is something that um, is attempted to be conveyed or, un, or appreciated, that you would like people attending satsang to appreciate, that uh, that which they take to be real, that which they take to be themselves, is ultimately not real and is not ultimately who or what they are. Is that what you tried to just say? Yes, and I, I like to, to direct to the root because it is of, I don't say of no use, because I used it myself for years, but uh, finally uh, you have not to, um, to try to see that this concept is unreal or this or this or this. You have, if you solve the root, all the rest will follow. Mm -hmm. So I try to show that this is very important. And so how do you uh, go about getting people to the root? According to what they say, I try always to throw them back where they already are. Uh-huh. So, That's for so job. for instance, if they were to say, "Well, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm very unhappy because this and that is happening in my life," or something like yes. that, then you might say, "What? To whom belongs this unhappiness? Is it not to your mind or body? Mm -hmm. You see your body, mind. You see this experience." So, who are you? And you know, uh, this is a bit uh, uh, such a traditional teaching, and sometimes it's more like a Zen, a strange answer which may root out. It depends. Sometimes it's a bit more with explanations, and sometimes not. Yeah. But it's always to try to root out the first or to indicate to indicate that it is the eye of the trouble and not 
whatever happens to the body or mind. Mm. And, and how's that going for people? I mean, uh, to what extent do you feel like people in satsang come away with a, a, a shift in their appreciation of who and what they are that, um, that actually sticks, you know, that actually somehow um, lasts for them? If it is an experience, it will never last. Huh? Mm -hmm. I don't know about what, but if they come, it must, they must be attracted by something. Yeah. Mm. And do you um, advocate or recommend or encourage anything for people to do um, when they're not in satsang throughout the week? Like, I don't know, meditate or, or any kind of, any, any sort of daily routine that might be conducive to, uh, to their quest? Yeah, first of all, um, I would say be on fire. It's like to fall in love with somebody, you see. Whatever you do, there is that somebody in you which in, who invades you. In the same way as liberation, you see. Mm. In the same way. Fall in love. No, it is of such a value. All the rest, okay, maybe you didn't taste enough, so go and taste and still keep contact with satsang. Maybe one day you will see how precious it is to hear uh, this indication of you are that and if you don't believe it it's because you still trust your mind fire fire yeah <laughs> so uh, I guess that one way of phrasing the question would be um, you know every time you come to satsang maybe it, it throws a log on the fire you know and make, makes it brighter uh, but maybe throughout the week when you're not in satsang or if you can only come twice a year or something like that Is, is there something where you can keep putting put ah, it, Putting yeah. more wood on the fire to keep it, oh, you know, stoke it Of course, we have the luck to have fantastic books of those same lineage, you see Yeah uh, Buddha's, Ramana Maharishi, Papaji first because it is through him that I knew all this mm -hmm. uh, I loved, I discovered not long ago, Siddharameshwar Maharaj you see, this is fantastic indications, plus all these Chan and Zen masters. Yeah. You read one line, you get inspired, you know, oh, what great it is. You, you see, and YouTube, what yeah. a fantastic technique now. Through YouTube, people keep contact. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then satsang alive at times, you see. There's a woman in uh, Australia whom I'll be interviewing in July who um, w was watching lots of, of YouTube videos of Muji, really liked yeah. Muji, who, who of course was a Papaji student. And, yeah. uh, and at one point, you know, just watching a YouTube video, she had this profound shift and she, she said she just laughed and laughed and laughed for hours, like pounding her leg at the kind of the realization that, you know, she was not who she had thought she was, you know, there was just this really significant shift. So. YouTube can do it. <laughs> yes, anything, you see, because after all, it is just to wake up, which is a strange way to say, to wake up to what you already are. Yeah. So, you know, I don't, I understand we, we speak and myself I have to say before or after and shift. In fact, there is nothing like that, but we have to speak. So, it's not even a shift, it's to see that we shift it, I shift it in a base which was away from what is. What I am is always there. Yeah, well it's one thing to say that or to read it in a book and it's another thing to actually realize it. And oh. you know, oh. I, I mean, I, I just, just this morning or maybe it was last night, I was listening to one of your satsangs and you were going through the thing of you know, of this number of people, only this many go this far, and only this many go this far, and only this many go on the razor's edge, and only this many don't fall off the razor's edge, and, and only, <laughs> only a tiny fraction actually end up, you know, realizing the self. Um, so it's one thing to hear these words or to read them in a book. It's another thing to actually, and to, you know, to realize, okay, you know, the, there was never any time when I was not that, but that, that's a concept until it becomes a living reality. So that's the trick, it seems to me, is for that to become a living reality and not just a concept. No, I agree. But that's why we speak of realization, in fact, isn't it? 
yes, there is this uh, difference. But you see, there is a difference when actually the I who doesn't feel yet, even though he, uh, he has no more search, he knows everything, that has never quite been questioned so far. Even though it looks like that one questions, no, he has not touched. It's strange enough, but it's like that. Because if he questions once, who am I? And keeps quiet, where this I disappears, you see. He will understand that whatever comes and goes, it is not what is, it's just the play, the waves of the ocean. And you, you see it once, it is enough. You don't need to repeat, I, I am myself, I am that, I am that, I am that. <laughs> yeah. That would just be chatter. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, I've heard you say many times, and I'm sure Papaji, Papaji said many times, this phrase, keeps quiet. Right? Oh. And I mean, the average person, I think, if they think, all right, I'm going to keep quiet, then mm -hmm. they sit there for a moment. Next thing they know, it's five minutes later, and their mind has been going all over the place. They haven't kept quiet. Yes. So, so what do you really mean by this phrase, uh, yeah. just keep quiet? Yeah, first of all, Papaji also was not really understood when he said keep quiet, mm -hmm. but it's always a good indication, even if you understand not so well, because at least you give a space to your mind. No, the real keeping quiet cannot be addressed to I, to I am seeker, cannot be addressed. I and the mind means the same, huh? cannot keep quiet or it is temporary. So when Master says keep quiet, he says it, go to the source of I, keep quiet. At least for a moment, so Whenever the mind comes back, because of course the ocean always has waves, you don't grasp it for once. You keep quiet. Then, then you realize yourself and it will be seen to you that all the rest are just strong old habits based on the past, previous beliefs. But they, then they are only habits. They are no more real. So this is something that one should do repeatedly. Keep quiet, keep quiet, keep, keep sort of coming long, back to the source, back to the source, right? As long, it's true. As long as he feels that his habits are too strong still. Yeah. Then he has I was thinking about a metaphor for this, and I was thinking it's, it's like if you say to someone in Calcutta, let's say, be at the source of the Ganges, you know, or, or stop the river, let's say, stop the river. It's a little hard to do in Calcutta. The river has tremendous force. Even if you said it in Hardwar, you know, uh, stop the river, there's still a lot of force at that point. But if you said it in Gangotri, if the person could somehow be there, then when, when the river is first emerging, then it might be easier to stop it or re redirect it or something, because it didn't, it didn't acquire this huge force yet. It is only, that's why the keeping quiet cannot be done before. You have to go there and then keep quiet. Mm. This so, is enough. So using that metaphor, you somehow have to get to Gangotri, the, the source of the river. And, and then fr if you can somehow get back to that point and keep quiet and, and stay there, then you're really living up to what is being advocated by this phrase, keep quiet. Is, is that correct? Yes, yes, it is. Okay, so maybe that metaphor will be helpful. Um, so again, th then I guess the, the, that begs the question, well, you know, like you said, strong habits. Uh, if, if the mind is like a river, which just has this momentum, and, and you know, it's, it's habitually busy and active and so on, how does one actually, I mean, is, is it sufficient to just sort of have the, the intention to whoom, get back to the source and keep quiet? Or is, is there some means or or method in some way to actually accomplish that. Because I think a person could go on for years with that intention and, and still the mind is unruly. Nobody does that, don't think so. Mm -hmm. They don't understand 
they, they think that it's a kind of practice and that they fall into a state of keeping quiet, which is temporary, and they think it's real and through more serious practice they will one day be permanent there. Nobody does that, very few, and those few is because they finally understood the indication, you see, mm. that can be done at any time for anybody. One can wake up to that at any time and anybody can hear that. But you see, we, we, don't, we don't do it. That's why it, it's so called doesn't work. <laughs> so, so people just don't do it. That's, that's the problem. No, they don't do. Because you see, often the concept of enlightenment is more cherished than the real enlightenment. Hmm. So there is always something obstructing, something, this I which has a cherished something. When you say the concept of enlightenment is more cherished than the real enlightenment, do you mean that, that sort of people think of enlightenment as something that they are going to get? Uh, and it's going to be this wonderful thing, and I'm going to have it, and I'll be so wonderful, and I'll be so popular, and <laughs> all that stuff. And uh, as opposed to the actuality, which is that it's, it's really a, a, an elimination of this I. Um, so it's not like something one can ever get. It's something that eliminates the, the, the person who thinks he can get it. I'm, I'm a little, a little long-winded here, but is that what you're saying? It, yeah, it makes disappear the concept of reality that I um, carries. When I disappears, you see, in its source, the concept that it's real disappears because if I can disappear, it means it's in time. It is in the mind. It's part of the mind and not as one thinks. Yeah. Mm. Um, I think maybe some people are... Th some people might think, well, wow, she was with Papaji as close as one can be for 29 years before she got realized. So what hope is there for me? You know, I, I don't even have yeah. a master or maybe I, there's some teacher I go and see once a week or once a year or something. Yeah. Uh, if, if it took her 29 years, it's going to take me 29 lifetimes or something. <laughs> what would you say to those people? The hope is that I say myself, I was a very bad student. Oh, you're just being modest. I'm sure you were, you were a very good student. <laughs> I mean, you were exemplary. You had a, you know, you, you sat under a tree for eight months in the rain, or no rain, it was cold. <laughs> very few people have that much fire, and yet it took you 29 years. No, no, it's for everyone, I tell you. There is not a story similar to another one. No, no. One should not, it's important, uh, one, one as an example, you see, a kind of, but not in the history. The history will be different for everybody. Yeah. Everybody. That but, is the beautiful hope. <laughs> that's a good answer. I, th I, I think uh, you're saying, and you would agree, that it's, it's really important not to compare yourself to other people. Oh, no. No. Yeah. No comparison. No comparison. Even in the teaching, you see, if any teaching happens spontaneously, um, you cannot comp copy even your beloved master. It's impossible. It's like that. No comparisons. Yeah. Yeah, well, hopefully everybody, I, I guess we don't have to elaborate on that point, but I think that's really important because, you know, I've done that myself and I know many people have. They, they think, oh, if I could only be like him, you know, or, or he, he seems to be or she seems to be having this wonderful experience and I'm yeah. not having it. And there's this comparison thing that can go on for, yeah. for years. One thing is very nice with the stories of everyone, maybe it's to inspire, you see, to, to put fire, to inspire, but not to copy. Yeah. The comparison has to stop there. It can inspire. That's why the books are there. It's not to copy. Yeah, good, good point. Um, and, and again, this, this thing I've been reading last week, this nothing ever happens, very inspirational. I mean, it, Papaji, was such, he was such a remarkable man. I, I didn't really know that much about he him. He is. <laughs> he is a remarkable Yeah, well, I don't know if he's a man anymore or, or if he ever was because he's something other than, deeper than that. But uh, what a remarkable life, you know. Um, yeah. So interesting just to read about 
the way he functioned and everything, you know, know. the sort of spontaneous, intuitive, uh, you know, way when, where even he didn't know why he was going someplace or, or anything, but then it turned out to be this perfect situation. Yeah. Yeah. Extraordinary. Many, many. It was like every day was practically like that with him. We, we are very lucky to have that in books also now because it inspires so many people. Yeah. Yeah. It does. Um, so there's been some discrepancy, uh, like for instance, in, in things David Godman has said um, about whether Papaji actually sent people out to give satsang. You know, or whether they just took it upon themselves to do so. Yeah. Um, do, you, do you have any feelings about that? I, I, I prefer to speak of myself. He never sent me anywhere. <laughs> Except to buy vegetables or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you don't really have any comment on all the people think, who have been you know, out. I think everything is perfect. Mm -hmm. Because, you see, when people teach, it means they have been struck by something and uh, whatever people, if they follow them, it means it's what they want also. So everything is perfect. Mm -hmm. I mean, who cares? And the one who wants really what my master said, he will find also. Yeah. I kind of get that sense that there's so many teachers these days and maybe they differ in their in their clarity or the you know the the way they teach or the quality of their teaching or something but it's uh, there's a saying I don't know if you've heard this it's different strokes for different folks um, so but I do, and you know many people also they need to be healed they need to be loved they need to be protected then there are also many for them and then maybe when they are enough loved feel they feel like that maybe they will hear something different they want to wake up to their true nature we never know everything is perfect yeah that's really good i agree um and everything means everything i mean no matter what a person is into that it it may be just a transitionary phase for them they're they're getting what they need and if if they're not then they're not going to stay there they're going to go and do to something to else hell or so why Pardon? not what you say? If they want to go to hell, they also go to hell. I yeah, mean, have that experience. It's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Good way of looking at it. <laughs> um, <laughs> Gangaji once said that she was told by Papaji back in the day that people coming to her were very well prepared and that there wasn't much she needed to do or say when they showed up, that they were being sent to make way for the global awakening. So there's two parts of that question. It, one is that people who come for satsang are are very well prepared, perhaps, and, and there isn't much one needs to do for them to wake up. There's that part you could comment on. But also, did Papaji talk of a global awakening? Is never he, to me. Pardon? Never to me. I so, never so you had never heard that? I but. never heard about global. Okay. So he didn't have any grand vision for the world undergoing some big change or anything like that? You know, I think in the 19... In the years 90 of Lucknow, uh -huh. he wanted to offer m to, to more people, mm -hmm. which has been done. Right. And he sent even messengers, whatever they take themselves for, and this has been done to, to, spray, to spread. It's true. Yeah, so, true. in that way, uh, he had. But you know, Pap Papaji would not have. I think it was more spontaneous with him. Mm -hmm. He didn't have this intention, I do that for global thing. He just did it when the time was like that. And of course, there was a spreading which was not there before. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm not of those times, so I don't know much. Okay. Of those years, except those I read and I, I meet many of those this time. That's a good answer. Um, there, there's a common saying that Papaji is often quoted as having said, which is give up the search. And, uh, and also things like, you know, there's nothing to do, you already have it, just be still. And he was no doubt, you know, in saying this, he was no doubt stating the absolute truth. But he also meant that when you've made it to satsang and you're sitting with a true teacher, you can finally relax. 
that your head is in the tiger's mouth, so to speak. You've been caught. You've crossed the river, you know. So you're able to lay down your practices and previous knowledge and all that came before and just be open and receptive to grace. Um, and that's what Ramana told Papaji when he came to his door. And, you know, because at the time Papaji was a lifelong Christian devotee and, and was reluctant to give up his practice. So this is a little bit of a long question. I'll just keep going for a bit and then you can respond. Um, so Papaji was... This is, again, this continuing question. Papaji was not speaking to the seeker who is still in the heat of seeking, wanting more you know, spiritual knowledge, or those at the beginning of the journey, or even midway. He told those types to seek as if one's pants are on fire. You know? uh, so there's different teachings for different stages of the process. And you know, the, the questioner here is saying, so sat, satsang is the end of the process, the end of the Vedas, the end of seeking, the realization that surrender is the only avenue after one has exhausted all strategies for awakening, which is why taking a master's words out of context does not do one any good. Um, so she's saying that the truth of Vedanta is not understandable to the average person. It's easily misinterpreted. Most are not ready for it. Would you, would you agree with all that or comment on it? I mean, there is not much to say, to add. The thing is, I told you, welcome to everybody to satsang. When I say satsang, it may be the direct indication, you see. Mm -hmm. But those who don't feel uh, it's not for them, they will go by themselves. They will go somewhere else where they feel it's more understandable, it's more their thing for, the, for that time, and the others, they stay. So we don't even need to say all those things. It happens naturally. <laughs> yeah, but you, you would sort of that, agree with that, even though it's not necessary to say it? I don't like when it is labeled so much, because then it's like the select, selected ones. We will fall in these archetypes again of selected ones. I don't like it. It's for everyone who cares. Yeah. Uh, cares. And those who, who don't feel or attracted, they will drop and find something else. Yeah. No, that's a good point, because if we went by what she said in that question, then people who were at satsang might feel like, well, I'm the mature. No, well, no. You know, I, I, I am almost finished. All these, know, all these beginners those, go. Those almost finished, they can stay years up to the end of their masters and both finished, and they are never finished. <laughs> so, no, no, let's drop it. Okay, good point. Um, one thing that you often hear, I mean, don't hear very much in um, Vedanta or in, you know, the, the non-dual teachings is much talk of devotion. And mm. yet, yet uh, in reading, you know, about Papaji's life, and yours for that matter, um, you know, there's a lot of talk of God, the divine, devotion, seeing Krishna, seeing other gods. You know, there was that story when you, you, you and Papaji went to Vrindavan, you're both dancing in ecstasy in the streets and so on. So um, what, what role would you say that devotion has to play in this whole realm of yeah. spirituality? First of all, I don't, the, the real devotion you see is uh, towards the truth, mm -hmm. to hear, to be, to love, and to love the guide that you still need, uh, because he will bring you. You trust he will bring you to the truth. That devotion, um, and there is no self inquiry if you don't have devotion for it. If you uh, are not devoted to to the one who tells about it, it's so natural. It goes together. I don't think it's possible otherwise. But then devotion doesn't just mean sort of d determination or fixity on one's teacher or, or one's path. It also means f great feelings of love and bliss and, you know, that kind of thing that you read about if you read the Srimad Bhagavatam or, or other devotional texts, you know, the Bhakti Sutras and, uh, and all that. So, and it seems like Papaji was a great devotee. I mean, you'd hear these stories of his, his love for Krishna and you know, prostrating in front of Ramana Maharshi's picture, and, and there was nothing flat or dry about it. Uh, seemed, a, seemed a very heart-oriented kind of experience. Yeah, but Ramana Maharshi said also to him that is the devotion, is God here now? What's that? So, Ramana told also Papaji, is there God, the, your devotion, here now? when it was not. Right. So 
all those are experiences which come, of course, why not? It is like wonderful toffees of your own self. Come and love me, love me more and more. It's worth, you see. But they are experiences. So we should not uh, be um, washed away also, even though um, what a blessing. But they are experiences, huh? Yeah, I got that's a good point. Um, they come and they go. In fact, that's a famous story of Papaji, that, I, as I recall hearing it, that he was late for, for showing up or something to see Ramana. And Ramana said, where, where were you? And he said, I was playing with Krishna. And he said, well, is he here now? And, uh, nope. <laughs> yeah, so he, he was kind of pointing to that which is always here. Because of that, he could finally, you know, um, keep quiet. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So his life in nothing ever happened. Everything happens there. Yeah. Yeah. This is you can one cannot comprehend, isn't it? It's full of of expressions, and it is quietness itself at the same time. Yeah, paradoxical. So um, I have a question about uh, stages of development. I've heard you say many times there are no stages of development, you know, and and um, yet, wouldn't you say that? You know, Papaji, for instance, was in a more advanced stage of spiritual development than some of the crazy people who came to him, you know. Otherwise, why would they come to him? And if he wasn't in a more advanced stage, why would we go to him and not just some, anybody, you know, just somebody we found in a bus station as our teacher. We want to be with someone who is more spiritually advanced than we are as a teacher, as a master. Yeah, but, but I don't consider Papaji having a better or elevated stage. He was... He woke up to what he is. He's a master mm -hmm. of liberation, you see. He, he, he woke up to his own nature mm -hmm. and had the capacity to deliver the indication so that the others, for all the others, they are seekers, all the others. And uh, of different stages, of course, of different experiences, more or less deep Okay. according to their practice before or their fire. Okay. So then there are different stages or degrees of depth of, of you know, realization. Um, Absolutely not. Oh, well, <laughs> you just said that all these seekers were at different See? stages according to their practice and Papa yeah, G was... Yes, yeah, sorry. No, but a seeker, it is somebody who has got so many experiences, he can even have eventually a glimpse, the experience of enlightenment as somebody. Now, master is, it is, is not somebody. Right. He, he has demystified that he was somebody, even though he appears to us to be somebody. <laughs> You know, so there is no common measure, I don't know, in English. Uh, we, we cannot compare that. No comparison, yeah. Huh? Okay. Yeah. So seekers maybe... Seekers have stages, sure. Okay. So seekers have stages, but masters are beyond stages. Is that a way of summarizing? Yeah. 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 Can okay. Yeah. And, and so once... So once mastery has been achieved, so to speak, or realized... Uh, then there are no no further refinements. There are no gradations like this. This master is at, is at a more powerful or deeper, or clearer level than that master. It's it's all sort of they're all in the same club, so to speak. Once master has. <laughs> 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 but first of all, the master would see, and that is the great teaching that any stage is unreal, mm -hmm. and that's how he can help. The one who is asking. Now, about the one who woke up to his own, let's say, who realized that he was always that, uh, there are no, no stages. Now, some they teach and some don't. Um, that's all I can say. Some they teach and some, you mean some teach stages and some don't? Is that what you mean? No, no, no. Some. Oh, some teach and some don't even teach, teach at all. Some, yeah. Yeah. I, I guess I've not met, but it's possible, of course. Well, sure. I'm, I'm sure that there are 
you know, sages or real, realized beings who it's just not their dharma to teach. They they just sit yeah. in a, they sit in a cave or they sit under a tree or whatever. And or, they, they are, or they are husbands. Or they're husbands. Yeah, they might be working <laughs> working in a business or something. We never know. Yeah, no, I know people like that. Um, <laughs> something else about this question mm -hmm. I wanted to ask. Uh, maybe it'll come back to me. Um, Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, just that, um, like, you know, if you read different books like the Bhagavad Gita or the Yoga Sutras and all, you know, they do they do talk about you know uh, types of samadhi and stages of of the uh, development of the seeker, if we want to put it. So I guess that kind of corroborates what you're saying. You said for seekers, yeah, there are stages, but for one who has gone beyond all that, no more stages. Just mm -hmm. yeah, okay. Yeah. Just, just to reiterate. Um, <laughs> I heard you say in one of your satsangs that um, you didn't you didn't make much of the notion of vasanas that vasanas or or I'll have, I'll have you define vasanas but that vasanas could be in any way a um, a, a, a deterrent or an obstacle <coughs> to realization. Um, let's just discuss that for a little bit. If yeah. We, yeah. Okay. Because I know that. It is in the mind and uh, of a seeker, or even it, teachers are there to tell. First, remove your vasanas or make them sadvik or so pure that they quieten and all that, and then you will realize. But you see, I don't believe in this gradual uh, work which will never come. And first of all, you have to believe that somebody as is real to purify that. Or it is exactly because that somebody believes he is impure or pure that there is a problem. So we have to again question, but who is this I with this concept? Rather than to start to clean it, and if it is unreal, then what was the use? All the energy and all the life went on. Well, let me take a, an extreme example. Um, yeah. Let's say you go into a, um, a psychiatric hospital for the criminally insane, and you sit down with a group of psychotic, violent people. Okay. Uh, you know, just to take a really extreme example. Yeah, yeah. And um, you know, and then con contrast those people with the people who come to your satsang in Portugal. I mean, yeah. wouldn't, wouldn't you say that the people who come to your satsang in Portugal are much more receptive, much more sort of able to hear what you're saying than the psychotics would be. And, and so for the psychotics, it might be valuable to attenuate some of their vasanas, to sort of purify and clarify and, and you know, just be, become a more sane person as a, a, in, in the direction of being able to appreciate satsang. I understand. Yeah. No doubt about it. But you see, this is not my job. I'm sure that a few compassionate, beautiful people do that. But I can't do that. It's not into my capacity. I am just good at this, that's all. That's what I do. But others, I'm sure, and I hope it is done. Oh, yeah. Well, I'm not suggesting that you go into a psychiatric hospital. No, but and... I, <laughs> I, explain, I explain that people will be there to help them. You know? Yeah. It's sure. No, but the reason I brought that up is to show that now there's an example of people who have a heavy load of vasanas, people who are, let's say, really crazy. Uh, th there's a lot of impurity. And, you know, and that, and, and perhaps if, and traditionally it's said that, you know, well, uh, sattvic nature is more conducive or more receptive to awakening than a tamasic nature or an e a negative nature. Yeah. And so, you know, that kind of leads some credence to the notion that it might, there might actually be some value in, in purification in the direction of being more uh, worthy of or more receptive to. Uh, First of all, I think that it is when you are well rajasic, well passionate, that you want to finish off things. Yes. So uh, already, uh, the tamas, it's true, it is uh, so obscure that you don't even have a space to, of course, to this idea of enlightenment, that is sure, and they need some other help. Yeah, they're all clouded over. 
Yeah, that is, of course, if we go there, you see. Now, the Sattvic people are no, not more help than the Rajasic one because they are so saintly or comfortable or peaceful that they have no more fire to question what. That it could be. Happen. It could it be. Could happen, it could but, happen, but I mean, you were a pretty Sattvic person, but you had a very bright fire, you know, so. But I was Rajasic, I think, so. Yeah. Well, what the, they I say that. I, go ahead. Please, I don't want also to say you have to be Rajasic or this or that. I just want to say that about this self inquiry, it crosses the, the gunas, you see. It crosses those tendencies. Except the tamas, a rare one will be touched by grace even then. Yeah. But that is, of course, more rare. More rare. Yeah. So there's this saying which I often quote by some Zen teacher. He said, uh, enlightenment may be an accident, which might be an equivalent word for grace, but spiritual practice makes you accident prone. Uh, so, you know, and they say that Rajas destroys Thomas and Sattva destroys Rajas. So it, it seems that there's always a possibility of someone with a lot of Tamasic quality of course awakening but the the probability seems to improve as one moves towards sattva but i don't agree that the sattvic people uh, have more chance i don't maybe not maybe it is because we are in kali yuga you know so i think uh, <laughs> uh, our life here uh, even now in india you know no i don't think that the sattva helps the sattva will help to have samadhi to have a marvelous, uh, blissful, or, or peaceful state for longer than a normal experience and all that. But then what? There are still somebody there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they have to practice to maintain that, so nothing is real. Hmm. It's not worth. Good. I do know that I've met people who are just kind of fanatical about sattva and others oh I, I have to be so careful not to eat this and and not to do that and and there's there's sort of this obsess obsessive quality you know which becomes a, a hang up in itself it becomes a concept again you see and uh, a satsang is to remove concepts yeah yeah otherwise uh, when we will be when we will have a, a moment a time free from concept if we have to <laughs> fulfill the concepts Tell me. <laughs> yeah. uh, a couple of questions came in. This is from Paul in Portland, Oregon. Um, he said, I have recently begun this inquiry. Who am I? The process seems so mysterious and nebulous. You know what nebulous means? Ne oh, ne nebulous uh, means vague, yeah. like a cloud. Yeah. And I long to understand it so I can do it correctly. How does inquiry work? Uh, and finally, a little bit more on his question, how can one have confidence they are doing the inquiry in the way that the lineage of Ramana, Papaji, etc. teaches? He has to confront with a, with a master, with a satsang, a life. Because mm. you see, to reply like this indirectly or through words, he can read better in very good books. It, uh, Ramana has explained it so well, Papaji too. So if he still asks, he has to come. Yeah. Well, he's in Portland, which is not far from Ashland, which is where Gangaji lives. And so maybe he could go Wherever there. Wherever he likes. Pardon? Yeah. He might Wherever go. he feels like. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Um, here's another one from Durga in London. She asks, could you please tell me your views about depression? and whether it's still possible to awaken if one is in extreme suffering. It's just a concept that one has swallowed. Hmm. Well, you know, I mean, it, it can also be a biochemical thing that one's brain chemistry is off and it's one, one is... It's just a concept because one believes is a body and mind, you see. So I will tell her, Whatever you can describe, it's not you. Let, uh, let her make this neti neti. Not this, not that. I'm depressed. I feel it deeply in my heart or body or mind. I can know it. I am not that. It will help her. Help to lift her out of the depression. Yes, help to see that after all, 
it's an object. Mm. It is an experience like another experience. If But one gets attached to a few experiences, you see, because it gives them, according to their past, happy or not happy past, it gives them a sense of personal existence. Mm. And this is the seeming drama. Yeah. What, did, what did Papaji have to say about bliss, about Ananda? He seemed like a very blissful man. And, uh, and you yourself, but in your own experience, you time? seem very... Pardon? Not all the time? Not he wasn't all the time? Maybe would not be happy that I replied that. <laughs> <laughs> but I tell not all the time. Yeah. Unless the bliss which is spoken by the wise man means you cannot objectify what it is. You see, it's peace, it's bliss, it's joy. Of course, there is tremendous joy, but it happens this way sometimes and another way. Some, I, I cannot accept experiences of bliss as real. So bliss is necessarily like a wave on the ocean. It's, the, the ocean itself isn't blissful in its nature? But you can say, but then it will never express by bliss. Those who speak of bliss, they speak of the expression, isn't it? Yeah, but there can also be this underlying sort of fulfillment or contentment or happiness, which seems to just persist regardless of the surface fluctuations, you know? I uh, don't believe that you can objectify yourself. These are expressions already, hmm. maybe very deep. They go on changing. How about your own experience? Do you, um, this is my experience. Do you feel, uh, ever feel depressed or any negative emotions like that? Depressed, surely not, mm -hmm. because the search has gone from the mind, you see. Mm -hmm. So, negative emotions, what do you mean, sad, sometimes? Yeah. I, react to, I react to my circumstances mm -hmm. with the body-mind. The thing is, the confusion is gone. Right. That's all. But I'm, a, I, I, I'm just a natural human being. <laughs> That's good. And even when you're feeling sad, is it all consuming? It's like, you know, like with some people, they might be so overshadowed by it, like just sadness, you know, completely. That's my world. Um, if you have a wave of sadness, it, there are waves. There are waves on the surface of something much deeper. It's not lived like that, you see, because I don't think there is separation anymore. The sense of separation is not there. So in that way, I may say when I am sad, I'm sad. And when I'm not sad, I'm not sad. And it doesn't give more doubts or, or thought about, oh, I was identified or, mm. oh, that was not the truth. All that is gone. Mm. So... So you're just living naturally. It looks like. Yeah. Hmm. Um, I read in, uh, this is a strange question maybe, and you don't even have to answer it if you don't want, but I read in, uh, in David Godman's book that Jean Klein thought that Papaji was dangerous and warned, <laughs> warned students away from him. And I found that, <laughs> that a little puzzling because, you know, from what I know of Jean Klein, and he seemed like a very, you know, enlightened man. Um, so what was his problem? with Papaji. Oh, you should have asked him. I didn't get the chance. <laughs> <laughs> he was truly a gentleman. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, that's a tactful answer. <laughs> um, okay. So um, we've covered quite a few things. Um, what haven't we covered? I, I know another question will probably be coming in in a minute, but... Um, is there anything that you would like people to hear or know that we haven't discussed so far? Well, I am a bit blank. I, uh, <laughs> you <laughs> gave me blank. <laughs> okay, I'll try to s stir up something. No, well, let me ask you this. I know that you have these nice satsangs online. I've listened to f about five of them now. and. Um, People can do that. And uh, I also mentioned on your website that you travel. So do you actually go around the world still and do satsangs here and there? Or do you pretty much stay in Portugal now? 
I pretty much stay in Portugal, and yet since two years, I uh, I do a few trips. It's true. Mm -hmm. um, I want it for some reason. I want it that it is known that in Portugal satsang is available, mm -hmm. and um, maybe those who are interested when they see me in some cities, they can come here, and I can visit them again there if. There is enough interest. Yeah, I don't go all over the world, but I, I travel a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Are there accommodations in Portugal? If a person wants to come there, is there a place for everybody to stay? They are. It's a bit the weak point because I don't have an ashram, but everybody so far finds places. Yes. Hmm. It's okay. It's okay. Sounds like a nice place on the seashore. It is a wonderful place. Yeah. <laughs> yes. A wild ocean and quite away from everything. And four times a, uh, a week, satsang gives a, a color. You know, it's uh, it's nice. Yeah, that's like a regular, um, almost a ongoing, you know, thing. Four yeah. times a week. That's great. <clears throat> um, here's a couple of questions that just came in from Mary. Uh, she didn't give her location. She said, um, first of all. Let's answer these separately. What does love mean to you? Love means everything. Uh, I don't think the world is sustained if there was no love. It means the self, you know. Mm. The self. So there's that saying. I don't speak of relationship. No, you saw a deeper kind of love. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like love makes the world go round. Um, <laughs> so the world is sustained by love. That was a nice phrase. Yeah. Do you th do you associate that with with God or the divine when we we talk of love? With the self, with reality, mm. you know, with what you are, and you know, when you don't have a sense of separation, it looks very much like love. Huh. Yeah, you know, there's that saying in the Bible to um, do unto others as you would do unto yourself, and. Uh, so it would seem that if if you if there's no sense of separation, then others are yourself, and you'd love, you know, the others as much as you love yourself. And therefore, not mistreat them in any way. Circumstances may provoke some strange things, but uh, I mean, it's unshakable, untouched love or reality. Mm. You know, I use less this word word love because there is too much concept on, on it and uh, right. but of course i cannot deny what what to say hmm? yeah it has kind of romantic connotations usually um this is sort of a related question uh, from mary again you said that all appearances are not real does this make all life forms in uh disposable you know lacking value since apparent, since the world is a, a mirage, does that sort of mean? Yeah, that, yeah, 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 yeah. But you see, this sentence comes once you realize. No, the sentence is heard by a seeker to indicate them the proper, to give them the proper indication. Look, look and see if I is real, because if you apply that. I think there will be very misunderstood behavior, misunderstandings, and completely cuckoo behavior, <laughs> and excuses sometimes. Oh, it's unreal, so I can do whatever. No, it's real for body mind. Yeah, it's real for body mind. It has the, a seeming reality, and so uh, natural intelligence goes on with that. It's a way to teach. It is not uh, the truth. In truth, everything is real and nothing is real. Mm, nice. So again, we cannot, you see, comprehend. Also, if you look at the behavior of masters like Papaji and others, um, they seem to be very concerned with people's well-being and, and, you know, very compassionate and so on. They don't just say, oh, you're not real. Like, for instance, there was some story where some, some guy, some German fellow, for some weird reason, 
drank some laundry detergent yeah, because he thought it was going to purify him or something. And Papa G like did all sorts of things to try to help him get the, the poison out of his stomach, you know, <laughs> and all kinds of things. He didn't, he didn't just say, oh, it's unreal, don't worry about it. <laughs> no, but that's what I say. You see, the master is the most wise person. He will not take things this way. He knows very well, you see. Uh, everything is real, nothing is real. But to say, look, what comes and goes is unreal. It's a, it's a guide, guidance. It's a tool to touch who, who thinks is real. Because if you see that even I can disappear, as a concept of reality, all the rest is of the same nature. So it's, it's just an indication. It is not a saying, uh, all is unreal and all what the mind will understand with all its logic, which will be a disaster. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Good. Um, here's a couple of questions from Abe in Canada. Uh, first question, could you please elaborate on the word demystifying the mind, which mm. is a phrase that you use very often in satsangs. Mm. To see that the mind is just an object of yours and to go back then more easily to the subject instead of being mystified by objects and its hypnotism generally. Mm. To slowly go to the to the root subject. It's the subject which is into cause, into question. Uh -huh. So not be so caught up in it, in other words, get, get, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, second question, would you please speak a bit more about keeping quiet? Uh, we talked about that earlier, but he wants some elaboration. I understand that it is not physical quietness, like not talking. Would you say it is um, as the passive experience of the waking state in which the I is arising as anything else? I don't think that's totally clear, but I, I'm sure you can elaborate on this point of keeping quiet. Uh, I didn't really follow, but what is clear is that you keep quiet when one doesn't grasp the thinking, mm -hmm. the movements of thinking power. Then you keep quiet. Then is there anybody keeping quiet? And you said earlier, it's not like you're not think. It's not like you're not thinking. You you will be having thoughts, but you're not sort of caught up in them or something. You right? don't confuse anymore. You don't confuse anymore yourself for the one who thinks. Uh huh. Mm. So there's like a discernment we could say, or a discrimination between the self no. and the thinker. Could you say that? discrimination no it's a fact it's a it's a fact the confusion disappeared okay. a, a discriminative discriminative mind is used on the journey i would say if one has a journey mm -hmm. you see you, know, you have to know what to follow or or whatever but uh, at some point even this has to be left behind and to be busy with who is discriminating? This is the main, the main point, if there is any. Hmm. Is to know who is, who is discriminating, yeah. who is thinking, who is acting. Yeah. It's first to be clear that you will not solve anything with the infinite objects of the mind, let them be, be the subtle in the mind or in the body, but you have to question the owner of it, the doer. Yeah, and when you really do that, don't you find that the doer actually is not a doer? Because doing, doing implies engagement, activity, and so on. And we're referring to something which is beyond the field of activity, aren't we? Absolutely. Activities and doer, they, they rise from who you are, hmm. and they disappear into you, who you are. Sure. Mm. The thing is that we make one step uh, away, believing I. I is already the first expression. It's an expression, but we take it as the main base. We cannot go prior to I, it looks, you see, when we are a seeker. So, in satsang, 
we hear more and more and or we click or we get we more and more awakened that oh that first base we take for granted in fact is a step too much that gives the sense of separation mm. so when one goes beyond that then one goes beyond separation correct absolutely separation is created only if you believe that the rising eye is real mm. and so if you if you go beyond that, if you have gone beyond the belief that the rising I is real, um, is there still any sense of I whatsoever? Or has one sort of landed in a place which is impersonal, beyond a, a, a sense of I? First of all, everybody is already himself. So, everybody. The only thing is, he believes that I is real, so he wants to experience who he is as he experiences everything else. That is the trouble. Mm. Now, what you say, the sense of I when it rises is there, but it is known, it is demystified. It, there is no more confusion that rising I and that body mind is what you really are. That is gone radically. Yeah. So, what you just said then is that one can. And, and words are always you know, limited in the way you have to express things, but that uh, this state of realization or enlightenment or whatever you want to call it is not going to be an experience like any other experience that we've ever had. It's not an experience. It's beyond experience. We can even remove the word beyond because it gives this concept that you have to go somewhere or you are not there now. Yeah. yeah. You see. You are it there now, but because we believe that I, somebody is real, <clears throat> uh, we, we, we have the habit to objectify our world, to experience it. So, so it looks that we can never attain what we really are. Now, to realize what is already here, we just have to make disappear this, this I, how, going back to its source. Mm. Uh, I go back always there, you see, to remove the concept of prior and beyond, which is fantastic at some stages, but in fact they are also, they can also create a concept. We should be removed from concept. Mm. It's difficult to talk about this stuff without using words like that just because the whole the whole language is built upon objective experience you know and so you, you keep you have to like be very careful what you say when you try to describe these things and and you you, you never quite do it properly and, and i don't mean you i mean one you know me or anyone yeah sure sure but also it is the the how to say the passion or the the compassion of the teacher to point out if he sees that the word comes from some places to to point out, oh, uh, you have to correct here, but the same word can be expressed, uh, how to say, without a base, and then it's all right. Yeah. For instance, I was listening to one of your satsangs and the, at the end the children come in and there was one where you, you were saying to the children, now you please sit over there so I can see you. And now, you know, that seems very dualistic. There's a you and there's seeing and there's here and there's there. But that's the way language works, you know, and, that, and you're communicating to people in a relative sense. You want the children to move around. You know, words are uh, inadequate to describe the reality. Uh, and that we use dualistic words for the sake of practicality, you know, sure. you know get, please pass the salt or, you know, go there and buy this and, and you know, how do how you do, what is your name, things like that. But that doesn't really hit, hit the, the depth of the reality. So you want to just elaborate on that a little bit? Yes. First of all, <clears throat> it is impossible to describe uh, what is because the mind comes from what is and disappears there. So he's no more there when he could have words to, to bring and tell 
you know, it disappears, it's, it's just dying there. So, but in satsang, the, the words which are used are not for the word, but for the, the um, target, they, they indicate something else. That's different. Yeah. What, so was, what, what was the word before the, you said indicate? That for the target, did you say? or It, it has a target. Yeah. Target, target. The, the word. It gives an indication to follow. So you don't follow the finger, but the indication that it follow, uh, it shows. Yeah, it points to the moon, but, it, but it's, yeah, just a, yeah. it's just a pointer. Exactly. They are pointers. Yeah. Which, of course, is books and everything else. It's... it's uh, you know, we, yeah. we need words to communicate. But that's why you see, it is, I would say, needed to, at some point, come to a satsang life. Yes. You have to be confronted by, by a pointer life uh, that may shake your own convictions or your doubts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Well, that's a good point to end on, perhaps. It's an invitation for people to come to a live satsang, either yours in Portugal or Absolutely, else. but uh, yeah, where, where this is indicated, it is important yeah, to go. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, then we've discussed this a little bit, but uh, you're, you're based in Portugal near the seashore and people can come there and you do satsang four times a week and um, they can find out more about that on your website. Um, which I'll be posting a link to and, you know, make arrangements to come there if they want. And in the meanwhile, there are quite a few um, satsangs on your YouTube, yeah. YouTube page that people can watch. <clears throat> um, and is there anything else you'd like people to know in terms of, you haven't written a book yourself, right? No, no, no nothing. Okay. There is one in Hungarian, but I think it's very localized. <laughs> <laughs> so... If, if anybody really wants to read that, they can learn Hungarian. <laughs> um, okay. Something's then. prepared. Uh, now my friends are transcribing some satsang and all, but it will take time, sure. <laughs> yeah. Good. Well, this has been very enjoyable. I've really, uh, I really appreciate. Oh, thank you very much. The opportunity to speak thank with you. you very much. Yes. Yeah. It's a, a pleasure. It was a very good moment with you. Yes, and likewise, I, I've really enjoyed this. So um, let me make a couple of general concluding remarks. Um, I, I've been speaking with Ganga Mira. I'll, I'll be linking to her webpage, as I always do with, with guests, and so people can follow up with her uh, and, and explore that webpage, uh, that website, and, uh, you know, s carry on, follow up with what she has to offer. Um, this, as I mentioned in the beginning, and as most of you know, is an ongoing uh, series of interviews. So if you'd like to explore past ones, there, come to batgap.com, go to the past interviews menu. Uh, if you'd like to see who's scheduled coming up, there's a future interviews menu, upcoming interviews. <coughs> um, you can be notified by email of new ones, if you wish, by just uh, filling out a little form on the, up, on the email link that you'll see. This also is... Uh, offered as an audio podcast in addition to video. So if you'd like to subscribe to the audio podcast, there's a link for that. You can get it on iTunes or Stitcher, those different podcast uh, platforms. So thank you very much for listening or watching. And um, I will see you next week. And thank you again, Gangamira. It's really been an honor to speak with you. That's very nice. Okay. <laughs>